Let's go pray and get into God's word today. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor. You truly are our king. You are worthy to be worshipped, praised, honored, and adored. That's why we're here today, to lift up your name, the name of Jesus. How precious is that name. Father, as we dive into your word today, where there needs to be conviction, would you bring it? Where there needs to be joy, would you bring it? Where there needs to be change, would you bring it? Lord, would you give us the courage to not only hear today, but put into practice that which we hear? Would you help us? Would you guide us? Would you direct us? In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. Amen. So we are in this series called Epic. If you're new to the church and you want to catch up a bit, go online to our app or to journeychurch.org. You can download, watch the past messages and kind of get up to speed. Um, I don't know if God's speaking just to me through what I see one of the major overriding themes are, or really if it's for all of us. I certainly hope it's for all of us, or today's message just isn't going to make sense today. But I see this set continually over and over again of what I'm calling conditional promises. And I've talked about it a number of times through the messages that we've had. And some, sometimes we don't like conditional promises. I mean, how many of you read the conditions whenever you get a new piece of software or something, right? None of us. But God's word, the conditions are worth reading. Would you agree? Because I promise you they will come true. Um, there's verses like that found in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. It says, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey my commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. So there's blessing and there's cursing found, in this case, in obedience to God's word, right? Do you agree? Is that what it said? Some of you are shaking your heads. Like Some of you are just being rebellious already. You're like, I'm not listening to the message. I'm not going to do anything that he says. You know, but all of these blessings and curses that I see, they surround what God's word says. And it says, if you will put those things into practice, if you will do them, then you will be blessed. So why do we as human beings have this tendency to continually violate God's word? Then, When we know it, we do it all the time, if we're honest, do we not? Sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small ways. You know, maybe our flesh gets in it and we want to be a little bit rebellious. There's all different reasons why we neglect what we read and fail to apply it. We'll read it and we're like, that verse is for her who's sitting next to me, right? And then meanwhile, she's thinking, that verse is for him. Come on. I am so glad he's here today, right? Some of you are like, yes, thank you, Lord. We always want to ignore it for us, and we think about when we hear the stuff like I'm sharing today, you know, how this applies to somebody else. But really today, would you let it, if it stings just a little bit, if there's something that God's trying to speak to you, would you let it sink in? Would you let him do the work that he wants to do in our lives so that we can experience that blessing? See, I think we as people are all too quick to ignore God's word, and sadly, I see the consequences of that each and every week as a pastor. Every single week, people are coming in here, oftentimes because of their own poor decisions. And I don't want that to happen to you. I'll start with sharing a story. Um, I have, I come from a very big extended family. My mom was the eldest of the family, and I have an uncle who's actually only a year and a half older than I am. There were eight kids. He was an accident, apparently, like my mom and them at the front end were, were, Uh, ones that they, uh, I don't even want to go there, but uh, so, you know, in that family, there were all different kinds of personalities. All my aunts, my uncles, they all had different personalities. So my mom was the first, and she's always kind of been the rule abider. She's the one who plays by the rules. She always tries to do the right thing. You know, that's been my mom. So all of her brothers and sisters who were more rebellious, they kind of make fun of her. So then the second one was my Uncle Bob. He's a great guy, lives out in California today. The third was my Aunt Linda. And unfortunately, I did not get to meet Linda that much. I heard about her through story because she actually died when I was only eight years old. So it was a tough situation. I remember observing it as a little kid and saying, no family should have to go through this. What is going on? Um, They would tell stories about Linda. She would rebel against everything. I mean, any form of authority, Linda was going to rebel against it. They tell her to get home at 11, she'd get home at 11.01, just to be like the, the one to do it. And I mean, she, w- she had this spirit that they would talk about where um, maybe some of you were like this. She was willing to take the consequence. Like she would stay out till 12 knowing my grandpa would be there getting ready to give her a whooping. 
I mean, she wore him out so bad that by the time my uncle came around, he was done giving whoopings, man. My, my uncle, you know, he'd been through eight kids, and he's like, ah, you know, whatever. But at that stage, she fell against everything, and sadly, she took that rebellion a bit too far into other areas of life as well. So she ended up using drugs and using alcohol, and as the story goes, um, her drug dealer kind of shorted her on the drugs that she got, so she thought it would be a smart thing to kind of object to him about that, and he actually killed her. He killed her. I mean, this was, you know, in the early 70s. I think it was like 77, 78. And, you know, for our extended family, it was absolutely devastating. Who had heard of anything in those days like that? And, you know, it was that spirit that she had inside of her that, you know, some of us loved hearing the stories about how she did, but there was something in her that was rebellious. And, you know, she paid an ultimate consequence. And, I think there are consequences spiritually as well when it comes to it that we may not die in the natural. Sadly, some do, right? When we maintain that kind of a spirit, we get ourselves in really, really bad places. But at the very least, we certainly don't live up to what God wants for us. We don't experience the blessing. We live in this place of cursing rather than this place of blessing. And that's not what God wants for our lives, is it not? So it was a really harsh reality lesson for me at a very young age, watching my family weep over her loss, right? So I want to beg a question today as it starts to go into today's story. Where do you find wisdom? And when it comes to the wisdom of the word, are you quick to rebel or are you quick to put it into practice? Are you quick when you're like, man, this come up, I'm going to do what God's word says? Or do you immediately have this reaction? So where do you find wisdom? Who do you take advice from? Let me give you a couple more examples and stories before we really dive deep into God's word. I've seen this time and time again, and it it really disturbs me. And I'm like, Lord, would you help the people of God, you know, be quick to there. I'll, I'll term this first one, what Mary Jo calls the lust bubble, the lust bubble, right? So We had a youth pastor in the very early ages of the church. Um, The church maybe had 300 people in total attendance, and the youth group sometimes had 100 kids in it. He had an anointing on his life. It was amazing, but he also had this thing in the back of his mind where he always wanted a woman. God hadn't given him the right relationship that he wanted, and uh, there was a woman that came into your life, and sometimes women are a plant from the devil and not of God, and vice versa, right? (laughs) I'm dead serious, right? So... I I feel for those of you who are single, right? I I have not experienced that personally. I've been married since I'm like 17 or 18 years old, you know? But I I get it, you know? So he's longing in his heart for this relationship. He's going after God. He's got an anointing of God. He's seemingly going to do great things for God. And then the devil puts this plant in his life that's a woman, and he gets into this lust bubble, and all of a sudden nothing else matters. Your lust bubble might not be over a relationship, it might be over something very different, but all of a sudden you get something in your mind and nothing else matters. You know what the word of God says? You've generally applied it in your life, even in that area for most of your life, but all of a sudden you are willing to discard everything so that you could go after that one thing. So we sat him down, brother to brother, a couple of different pastors. Brother, we love you. He wanted to get married to her within one month. Now, there's sometimes where that happens. I've heard of wonderful stories where occasionally it happens, but God also gives us wisdom and discernment, and he puts other people around us. So a number of us with no stake in the game are approaching him and saying, don't do this. It is a plant. Something is not wrong or not right. We see some things in this woman and her actions that you're not seeing because you're in a lust bubble. And if you do this, what kind of witness is that to the kids? You will lose your job. You will lose everything. If you do this, guess what he did? He went for it, you know. Two weeks later, not two weeks later, she ended up leaving him two weeks after they got married. So not only did he lose the woman, he lost his job. He still hasn't recovered in ministry from that day. Would you, when people around, God says there is wisdom in the counsel of many, right? He puts people in our lives that we're to receive wisdom from, and sometimes these lust bubbles overtake us, and then we foolish things that violate God's word, and then we wonder why we're cursed. We're wondering why we're suffering the consequences. So today, I pray you will hear my words and put them into practice. Sadly, he ignored godly wisdom, and the lust bubble won out. Listen to the verse that we're going to dive in today. 
from 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13. So who was one of the wisest men ever to exist? Biblically, Solomon, right? He wrote the majority of the Proverbs. Um, he had an amazing life. He was the son of David, who we preached on a couple of weeks ago. And this is kind of the conclusion of the age of Solomon entering into his son. Listen to what this verse said about the blessing he had from the wisdom that he was putting into practice. Now, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that which the explorers and merchants brought, and all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon, King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold. His shields for his soldiers were made of gold. Do you get that? That is absolutely incredible. 600 shekels of beaten gold went into each shield, and he made 300 shields of beaten gold, 300 shekels of gold went into each shield, and the king put them in the house um, in the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with pure, pure gold. This guy was a baller. I mean, come on, Jesus. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold, which were attached to the throne, and on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions kneeling behind, standing beside the armrests. I wonder if those are real lions. Come on, Jesus. While 12 lions stood there, one on each of the steps and the six, uh, six steps, nothing like it was ever made in any kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were made of gold, and the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon, for the king's ships went to Tarsus with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarsus used to come, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Thus, King Solomon excelled in all of the things of earth, in riches and in wisdom. How powerful is that? Now, if he was your dad, do you think you would listen to him? I'm posing a question. We're going to revisit this in just a moment here. If he's my dad, I'm like, yes, you know, like, yes. I mean, you, if you were getting wisdom from this guy and the counselors that he had around him, how incredible would it be to have that kind of counsel around you? We'll see what his son ends up doing. Um, I would certainly want him and his closest associates to be the ones giving me advice. So here is my conditional statement of today, James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. That youth pastor I told you about knew the word of God better than most people that I know, yet he failed to apply it in his life. Don't let that be you. I hesitated at sharing this next set of verses, but I don't do this because I need money. I don't do this because I want money. I do this and share this because I genuinely feel it's one of the biggest tugs on our heart that we battle with God about, that we struggle in when we don't apply God's word. So when it comes to this area of finances, do you think God's word gives us some stuff that we might put into practice? But then we get in our own lust bubbles and we gotta have that new iPhone? Or we got to have that bigger house than we know we should have. Or we got to have that bigger car than we know we should have. And the devil lies to us and enslaves us with debt, does he not? Over and over again. Do you see why? I mean, is the analogy good for you? We get something in our mind and all of a sudden you got to have that 60-inch TV? All y'all being real quiet. Come on. Okay, maybe it's not the TV. I'm going over all the guy thing. I've heard about some of y'all shoe closets. Come on now. Some of y'all's makeup collections, right? All of us are susceptible to this, are we not? But let, let me just share from God's wisdom. Everybody knows these verses. There's no doubt that you know these verses in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside. This is a set of conditional promises right here. You have turned aside from my statutes and not, have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But if you say, how shall we return? God answers them, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and in your contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And therefore put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Yet you look at the church and 80% of people don't put this verse into practice. 
And we wonder why our finances are cursed or why our finances are blessed. Do you want freedom in that area of your life? Why y'all getting real quiet? Can I tell you a miracle story? I hesitated to share this one as well, but I think it's absolutely incredible. You know, Mary Jo and I have been faithful to tithe since the day that we got saved. I mean, and really at first it was an act of rebellion. Some of you have heard this before. My parents weren't saved and I remember them talking about my saved aunt and uncle and how they gave 10% to the church and I did it just to get them mad. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm like, I'm gonna do it so they talk about me crazy too, right? But something inside of us quickly turned into not a have to, but a get to. And for all of our lives, God's generally provided for us. He's cared for us. And I had a few secret prayers behind the stage of like, Lord, like for the past five or six years, I'm like, Lord, would you pay off my mortgage? Which seemed an impossible, utterly impossible task. Lord, would you pay off my mortgage? Would you, would you pay it off, Lord? And uh, I, it was something that Mary Jo knows I was praying for behind the scenes, just believing for it to happen, like, you know, believe in God's word, but at the same time, God ain't going to deliver, you know. Uh, he's, I'm putting him to the test, but he's not going to deliver. And then we actually ran into a stumbling block a couple years ago. I have a business that's outside of here, and there was somebody else who was helping run the business. I had never had the business. We never had one ounce of debt. The church doesn't have one ounce of debt. We'd always run it biblically in accordance with God's word. This guy started to leave the business in shambles where we were actually $80,000 in debt. I'm like, oh my God, how is that ever going to be overcome? Um, he ended up leaving our organization in October. Do you know as we got in there and started to turn things around and prayed and believed God, by the end of that year, all $80,000 in debt was gone? How amazing is that? $80,000 gone. We were faithful to keep tithing all the way through, keep believing God all the way through. You know, this year, a lot of, then, here's where the miracle starts to come in as well. A couple years ago, in my industry, in the computers, um, there was these things called viruses. And the viruses would go and they'd encrypt people's computers and then you would need to use Bitcoin to pay for them, right? So I was introduced to Bitcoin very early on because of it when it cost about $300 per Bitcoin. And I ended up, it was very hard to get at that time. You could barely even get Bitcoin. So I ended up collecting a lot of it because I knew that there was these possibilities that people's computers would get encrypted and then you'd need Bitcoin, which you couldn't get instantly, right? right? So it was a very bad way in which I was introduced to it. But you know what God's word also says? What the devil intends for evil, God turns around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Do you know that? That in God's word? So there was one time I like, I'm, I'm never going to make any money. I owe $80,000 and all these crypto things keep coming up with the viruses and I got to buy it and keep it there. Y'all have heard of Bitcoin now, have you not? After y'all start making fun. God used something as crazy as Bitcoin to get my house within $30,000 of being paid off. Come on, Jesus. Is that not a miracle? Amazing miracle. Using something crazy, something that started out like a curse to turn it around to make it where that prayer that I had been praying all along, Lord, would you pay off my mortgage? Would you pay off my mortgage? It's within striking distance. God is so good. His word is so true. Would we apply it? It talks about it over and over again. Do this and you'll be blessed. Do this and you'll be cursed. Listen to wise advice and put it into practice. And ignore that stuff and guess what? You'll be cursed yet. Why do we keep walking in cursing? Why do we get so many counseling requests from people doing dumb things all the time? We're incessant for doing that. Come on, Jesus. We do it over and over again, hurting our own selves. Lord, would you give us the power to repent? Lord, would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives so we don't need to struggle anymore? So let's bring it back to a couple more situations before we go. We all need to be disciples who make disciples, and we can't have a bunch of excuses. I don't care if the issues, your relationships, or money, or where you want to live, or what you want to do in the next step in your life. The Bible has the answers to those things and God will put people of wisdom around you if you allow them in. What happens is when we're starting to sin, we push everybody away because we want to continue on in our sin. We love our sin more than we love repentance. We love our sin more than we actually love God. May that be crucified in this place today. This is where small groups come in as well. You could come here and act like everything's okay when you show up on Sunday mornings. You could walk through these doors and we say, how are you doing? And you're going to say, fine, right? Everything's fine. No, it's not. Usually it's not, right? 
But if you start going to a small group and people start to know you and you have these friends and these relationships, when you show up and something ain't fine, maybe they'll lovingly call you out. Hey, what's going on? We love you that much. We're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're here to help you. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're here to help one another through those difficult circumstances, not hurt one another in the midst of them. Some of us need to get into a small group even if we don't want to be in a small group. Can I get an amen, right? We need those relationships. They're vital to our lives. Don't hide. Don't, don't check out. When you're out there, that's exactly where the enemy wants you. You're right for the slaughter. That's when he's going to take you out. And he's going to be speaking all kinds of bad things to you, and you'll start to believe them. So where do you get your advice? If you're struggling in your marriage, don't go to your friend at work who's been divorced two times and tell him you leave that man. (laughs) But we do that, do we not? You know you won't be showing up to Mary Jo because you know she's going to tell you the truth, right? Usually when people do, it's because they're really ready to change. They're ready to listen to that wisdom. They're ready to make that change in their life. Allow those kinds of relationships to be present in your life where you have people who God has put an authority to be next to you, to help you, that you can trust. Because sometimes we all have stinking thinking. They used to say in recovery circles, your best thinking has got you where you're at. If you find yourself in trouble and you've been making all your own decisions, let somebody else think for you. There's no pride in that. Let them help you through that situation. God will put good people around you. Sometimes people don't want to go to Brinson either because they know he'll start with that. He'll start your whole thing. He'll be like, you don't tithe, you don't tithe, you don't tithe. (laughs) He'll call you out on whatever your issue is. I use that as one, but... Would you let those people speak into your life? Can I get an amen? Don't ignore wise counsel. So three people are clapping. They're the ones that, yeah, I went and I actually changed it. All right, back to scripture so we can start to round it out and begin to close it up. So Solomon ends up dying. His son Rehoboam becomes king. He's approached by a guy named Jeroboam, who was the king of the northern cities of Israel, who saw... Um, Solomon's death. He wants to go there to try to better his position and reinforce his position. And here's what ends up happening. Second Chronicles 10, 4. Your father's made our yoke heavy, or your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke upon us and we'll serve you. He said to them, come to me again in three days. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel of the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they said to him, If you will be good to these people and please them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel on the young men who had grew up with him and stood before him. And he said to him, What do you advise that we answer these people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke your father has put on us. And the young men who had grown up with him said, Thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, You made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than that of my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid upon you a heavy yoke, I will add to your your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, and I will discipline you with scorpions. So he has the advice of the smartest, wisest guy in the world and the counselors who were alongside of him, or he has the advice of the next generation of people who were alongside of him who were probably a whole bunch of rich, spoiled brats, not unlike any of us, who've ever been here. We make fun of the next generation at times. We make fun of people. You know, you think of the greatest generation uh, that we talk about in our era of the World War II generation that was forged in fire, that was forged in war, that had to make it. And we do complain and make jokes about the next generation and maybe their lack of wanting to do things, their lack of desire. Some of it's real, some of it's not. You can't stereotype everybody. But in this case, what's happening is they were in this house with all the riches of the house and they didn't you know, listen to it. They went out there and wanted to do what they wanted to do. And he ignored the wise counsel that was around around him and he wanted to listen to the people that were going to tell him what he wanted to hear, right? You see it even in rock stars, you see it in pastors, you see it in so many that build up all these yes people all around them, people that never tell them no ever, and most of the time it ends in destruction, does it not? Don't have a bunch of yes people around you. 
allow God to place some people around you who could check you on your stuff. There were serious consequences to that decision. Remember what we read just a few chapters ago about shields of gold and all this crazy stuff? Amazing. 2 Chronicles 12, 9, just a couple chapters into um, Rehoboam's reign. The king of Egypt came against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the Lord of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away the shields of gold that Solomon had made and Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept door in the king's house. As often as the king went to the house of the Lord, the guard came and carried them and brought them back to the guard room. And then he humbled himself and the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as to not make complete destruction. Moreover, conditions were good in Judah, so King Rehoboam grew strong in Jerusalem and reigned. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama the Ammonite, and he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. He did not set his heart to seek the Lord. The Lord. So in a couple chapters, it goes from shields of gold and prosperity to shields of bronze and barely making it a kingdom now divided. His reign is much smaller than it was under his father's reign. And it said he set himself towards evil. Do you believe that? He didn't set his heart to seek the Lord. So my question for you today is, is your heart set to seek the Lord? Are you willing to listen to wise counsel? Are you willing to do the things that the Bible says if you want to be blessed? Are you willing to be a disciple who makes disciples? Or are we going to have a whole bunch of excuses in our life? Uh, but Eric, I, I don't have the time. Eric, I, I work so hard. Eric, I don't have the money so that I could do what I need to do. Eric, the, t the list of excuses could go on and on and on, could it not? But if you want to be blessed... It says you need to seek the Lord. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Go read chapter 6. It talks about all the things that we worry about and all the things that we fret about. Lord, how am I going to be clothed? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to do this if I seek you instead of going out and doing this on the workplace and working 42, 82 hours a week all the time? How am I going to make ends meet? God has a way where there seems to be no way. If he could use something stupid like Bitcoin to pay off my mortgage, come on, Jesus. Can he not give you the job that you need so that you don't have to work 80 hours? He can do it. Blessing and curses I put before you. That's what the word says, does it not? Seek this day the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all the stuff you worry about, he'll take care of them. I'd like to invite the worship team to come back up to the front. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. We've got another song that we're going to sing together. During this next song, let me pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. When I opened up, I prayed that you would give us ears to hear. And Lord, I would add that you would give us the power to put your word into practice. Rehoboam certainly sat in a place where he saw his father's counsel. He saw the multitude of counselors that you had placed around him. And for whatever reason, because of whatever lust bubble he found himself in at that moment, he wanted to do his own thing and the consequences were great. Father, I think of my own Aunt Linda and that spirit of rebellion that sometimes rises up within us and how dangerous it could be, how her entire family mourns. I remember that day in elementary school where my uncle was taken out of class and I could see it through the window. I know you let me see that day where he was in tears and crying and his, his teacher was trying to be out there to help him through that difficult situation. Father, our decisions have consequences at a national level, at a personal level, at a family level. And what your word tells us is that if we'll seek you first, seek you first, seek you first, might we put that into practice, Lord? When that lust bubble starts to arise, would we go back to the word? Would we go to those counselors who you've put around us? Would we listen to them? Would we not entertain those thoughts? Would we seek you first? Father, forgive us for our sins, for they are many. Father, we all violate them more often than we'd like to do. 
For those right now who have done that in the area of your finances and your suffering, I pray for you right now as well. Would you trust him in his word? Would you change what you're doing? Would you align your finances with what his word says and watch what he does? For those suffering in the many other areas of life of bad decisions and bad consequences, man, would you repent today? Would you say, God, forgive me for seeking out counsel in all the wrong places? As Mary Jo's dad used to say, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. And man, we don't have to be tough in the Lord. He's there to hold us up. He's there to care for us. He's there to have your back. We don't need to take lumps. We don't need to go get a whooping when we get home. We can be empowered to live a life of righteousness and hope and peace and joy. And Father, I pray you drop that kind of an anointing on us right here, right now, today. The anointing of the Holy Spirit would flood our hearts and our minds. You are the ultimate counselor. You are the one who brings wisdom. If you don't have a relationship with God right now, I want to tell you it's the best decision you could ever make. Surrender your life to him and it'll never be the same. I'm not saying you'll never make a bad decision again, but you'll have a God who will come alongside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you. And if you'll listen to that still small voice, you will avoid a great deal of pain in this life. So I ask you today, is today a day where you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God? If it is, I certainly want to pray for you. Man, take wise counsel. Go for it. If that's you, would you do me a favor so I know who I'm praying with you? Would you raise your hand up real high so I could see it, so I know who I'm praying with? Today's the day you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God. Do it right now if that's you. I see your hand, sir. Thank you, God. Are there others that I haven't seen? Raise it up higher if it is. I see your hand over there on the left as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for moving in power and might among us today. Here's what I want to do. During this next song, you know, if you need to come up to the altar, come up to the altar and confess and kneel before God and let the tears out if you have to. Let God move in your life. Sense that repentance and move forward from there knowing the freedom that is in Christ. If you want to join hands with somebody, and I highly encourage this, you don't need to go through it alone. Myself, Mary Jo, others will be up here. Don't be afraid. What we hear here stays here. We don't share it with anybody. We would love to pray for you. We'd love to anoint you with oil. We'd love to share in that breakthrough in your life. So feel free to come on up. We'd love to pray for you. If you want to take your communion by yourself or with your family, there's communion elements to both my left and my right. You're welcome to come up. And then at the end of the song, we'll close out in prayer. If you're new, I want to encourage you to stop by our next step station where we'd love to help you get connected. And for everybody else, I pray that you'll go to the back and find a small group where you could thrive over the course of the summer. Let's worship God one more time. The altars are now open. Come to me, come to me.
more time. For God give me the Gold and silver. During the altar, one of our elders came up to me, and he actually made a very good point, and uh, I want to share it because I do think it's important. Um, you know, I don't want you to think that if you found yourself in trouble financially or in some other area of your life, that God's going to come in and you're going to win the lotto and it's going to all be better. You know, um, the fact of the matter is when I spoke of that situation with Bitcoin, um, you know, Mary Jo and I had always attempted to be super faithful. We were not in a position of crazy need. We had not done things to put ourselves in debt. We had not violated God's principles in that area. He chose for whatever reason through a miracle of his own working to give us a little cherry on the top kind of a thing that was absolutely an amazing beautiful blessing but what I found mostly in my life is what this verse says in the wisdom of Solomon Proverbs 21 uh, verse 5 it says steady plotting brings prosperity hasty speculation brings poverty right so we gotta we you know when he does those little things and we get those little miracles praise God you know but say if you take my addiction situation I had put myself in some bad holes you know the miracle came about through the process God didn't go and just beep, everything's better all of a sudden in an instant. So don't go out there buying no lottery tickets this afternoon. Come on, Jesus, right? Um, you know, sometimes it just takes that hard work, those right decisions, and God will open up those right doors. Do the next right thing and watch what he does. He is faithful and just to forgive. He is faithful. And man, you'll never know the depths of his love. Father, we thank you and praise you. What a wonderful day it has been already. I thank you that the house of God is full of people worshiping and exalting your name today. I pray this message touched each and every one of the hearts that was here today. Lord, for those who did raise their hands and say, I want to serve you, Lord, we join with them in saying, Jesus, you truly are the one and only begotten Son of God who died on a cross and rose from the dead that we might have life and have it abundantly. Lord, we want to live in the land of blessing and not in the land of cursing. This summer, would we take steps to not make excuses, but be disciples who make disciples. Would it start for some of us this very day by being brave enough for maybe the first time to go back there and get plugged into a small group or to sign up for a next step. Uh, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys.